Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Roger Lanius, Associate Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs here at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum here in Washington. I would like to welcome you to this wonderful experience where we get to meet the new astronaut candidates from, from NASA. And to host this activity today, I'm asking Leland Melvin, who is the, himself a former astronaut, a veteran of two missions, but also the Associate Administrator for Education at, uh, at NASA today. So without any further uh, commentary from me, let me invite Leland up to the stage. Thanks, Roger. How you guys doing today? Oh, come on. How you doing? All right. This is very exciting. This is a, the latest astronaut class, and they're fantastic people. You get to talk to members up on the space station right now. So what I'm going to do is bring them all up. I'm a former astronaut. I flew a couple of times in space, and I had a really cool thing happen to me when I was your age. What do you think it was? Okay, you don't have to answer. I asked my dad for a skateboard, and he said, we can't afford one. So I made my own. I became a mechanical engineer by making my own skateboard. And we're going to find out what these ass cans did when they were your age. So we're going to bring them up. You guys ready for them to come up? Yeah. All right. All right, I want to bring up Josh Cassida. Come on, Josh. A round of applause. All right, Josh. Good job. Next, we have Victor Glover. Victor, come on up. All right, all right. Ooh, okay, uh -huh. he's heavy. All right, next we have Nick Haig. Nick, come on up. All right, my man. Next we have Christina Hammock. Christina, come on down. The price is right. <laughs> all right, next is Nicole Mann. Come on, Nicole. Uh, all right. Next we have Ann McLean. Come on, Ann. Come on, you guys give her more love than that. Ooh, okay. <laughs> She's her call sign is animal. Okay. Next we have Drew Morgan. Come on, Drew. All right, all right. Oh, okay, we can't I can't even do all that. <laughs> and next we have Jessica Meir. Come on, Jessica. Nice to meet you. All right. <laughs> okay, so we have the ASCAN crew here. Why don't you guys sit down? And we're going to ask them, what was that thing that got you excited or got you going when you were their age? Ann, you need a mic. There you go. Uh, when I was your age, I used to see the space shuttle taking off on, uh, on TV all the time. And I thought that was the coolest thing because there were the people in this world that we're gonna go do something that's never been done before. They're gonna see something with their own eyeballs that no one's ever seen before. And they're using technology that's never been invented before. And to me, that was the coolest thing and I wanted to be part of it. Awesome. Victor. So it was curiosity. And one of the examples of my curiosity was collecting bugs. I love to collect bugs. I would put them in anything, a pocket, my backpack, did you eat them? I didn't eat them. Okay. Well, no comment. <laughs> but when my mom would go to wash my clothes, she would reach in and clean out my pockets, and sometimes I would forget to take them out. So to this day, she will not put her hands in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Nick? Well, I think the thing that uh, really got me started is when I was your age, I like to figure out how things work. And it got me in trouble quite a bit because I'd break things so that I could put them back together. And uh, that's, that got me started kind of on the same track as Leland. You, you know, I like to make things. Right, right. Awesome. Nicole. So when I was little, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I knew that I liked to explore and I liked to find out new things. So we would go camping with my family. And we'd go on a little hike. And then I'd say, Mom, Dad, can we go to the next peak over there? And we'd go to the next one. I want to go farther. I want to go farther. So I just kept looking and kept exploring. And that's what first got me interested. Awesome. Drew. 
I think it was inspiration from those astronauts that had gone before me. I remember when I was in fourth grade, I wrote a letter to Alan Bean, and he wrote back, and he sent me a picture signed by him. And I remember when it came in the mail, I was so excited. I thought I had been chosen to be an astronaut at that moment. <laughs> and I never lost that passion. I never lost my drive to do that. And um, I kept it. I stuck to it. And here I am, lucky enough to sit among these, uh, my seven classmates today. Awesome. Christina. Um, when I was little, uh, my dad was really into science, so we used to have National Geographic magazines around the house and other things like that, and I would always look through them, and I would tear out the pages that interested me the most. So on the, on the walls in my bedroom when I was a little girl, there were all these pictures of space and Antarctica. Those were the two things I loved, and so when I grew up, those were my dreams that I actually brought to fruition. I went to Antarctica um, after I graduated from college, and now here I am as part of the astronaut corps. So the things that you really love, turn those into your dreams and your reality. Awesome. Josh. When I was growing up, my dad was a Navy pilot, so I was surrounded by aviation and uh, was really interested in it. But I was also really interested in math and science and computers and really sports. and. Uh, I thought I was going to play Major League Baseball. That was the plan. And uh, I worked really, really hard. My off-speed stuff was okay, but my fastball was uh, not a fastball. Uh, <laughs> so I had to come up with a plan B. And I remember my dad saying, boy, if he could do anything differently, he would work really hard to be an astronaut. And I thought, wow, that is a job that, that combines everything, the math and the science and the exploration and, and the athleticism. And, uh, and thankfully, NASA doesn't need me to throw any faster than 75 miles an hour, or I wouldn't be sitting up here. Awesome, awesome. So this is all about STEM, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. All of these candidates up here have STEM degrees. So we want to get you guys inspired and motivated and excited to think about yourselves being an astronaut, being a rocket scientist, being someone who can help change the world because that's what scientists and engineers do. We change the world in really positive ways. We've got a SSME, a space shuttle main engine over here. This was the engine that took me to space on the space shuttle Atlantis. We have all habitats, discovery, all kinds of things in here. So you're going to hear about some of these things today when you talk to the astronauts in space. Now make sure you have your questions ready because you're going to be talking to two astronauts that are currently on the International Space Station traveling around the planet at 17,500 miles per hour every 90 minutes. Again, 17,500 miles per hour. Have you guys ever gone that fast in a car? I don't, I don't think so. But it's a really cool place. When I was up there, and I want you to ask this question, what do you think the hardest thing to do in space is? Make sure you ask them that question when they come up. For the Twitter folks out there, we're going to have a hashtag as hashtag astronaut. Let me see, make sure I have the, the right thing here. Hashtag astro class. And there's also um, another um, Twitter account at astro class 2013. So for those that are out there in the Twitterverse, make sure that you can send your questions in to our lovely Sarah back here. She's going to be fielding some of the questions. And we're going to have questions for the astronauts in space. Then we're going to find out more about our astronaut candidates and what inspired them and motivated them to be astronauts and come up here today. So we've got about 30 seconds before we talk to the International Space Station. So give a big round of applause for our team here. <laughs> Guys, look up here. We've got Houston. That's Mission Control in Houston, Texas. Picture up there. Who's the Capcom today? Does anyone know? Anyone know what a Capcom is? Capsule communicator. It's the person who talks to the astronauts in space. All right, I see Hal up there. All right. We got a few more seconds here. What's your favorite, what's the favorite thing that you've, let me give him the favorite thing you've done so far as an astronaut candidate? Favorite thing that I've done so far, all of it, all six months, but one thing that really stands out was being able to fly on the zero G airplane and experience the 20 or so seconds of weightlessness. It was completely way better than what I thought it was going to be like what floating around. What is it called? The Vomit Comet. <laughs> and why is it called that? Because you can use your imagination. Okay. All right, <laughs> it can get messy. Okay, you ready? Okay. I see Houston preparing. Let's do a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? 
Houston Station is ready. National Air and Space Museum, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Leland in the Ascans at the National Air and Space Museum. How do you hear us? Leland and the Ascans, we hear you loud and clear. Awesome, awesome. You guys are looking great up there. Mike, you've been pumping some steel up there or something. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go ahead, Mike. We're going to take some questions from the students here in the audience. Oh, so I was going to say they make us do that. <laughs> you have to do that, right? Just keep your bones and your muscles in shape. So we're going to take some questions from the students. I think the students going to be lining up now. Is that correct? We'll get them to line up, and, th and then we'll ask you two questions in space. What was the thing that got you so inspired when you were in middle school? Gosh, that's a long time ago, uh, Leland. I'm not sure if I can remember uh, middle school, but I certainly remember when I was in high school, it was the early days of the shuttle program and, and getting to watch uh, all of those launches that were happening every year. Uh, that's uh, definitely what inspired me about the, the space program and wanted, uh, what, uh, what uh, gave me the idea of becoming an astronaut someday. Fantastic. Rick, what about you? I know that was a really long time ago for you, but uh, <laughs> what was the thing that inspired you? <laughs> No, I think I, <laughs> thanks, Leland. Hey, yeah, I do remember actually back in uh, when I was in sixth grade or in that time frame, and uh, I remember whenever my teachers talked about space or talked about planets, uh, that would just uh, interest me to no end. It was my favorite subject, and of course, I was always interested in airplanes and flying and things like that. So it just kind of naturally came together that I went and became an engineer, and then I. I decided to apply as an astronaut, and of course it took me many, many years, and it took me a lot of hard work, but eventually I did get selected. So it started at a very young age. It's just uh, a, an interesting subject for me. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, you guys, are you ready for some questions from some fantastic students from the, the D.C. metro area? Okay. Good would you please, We're ready. Would you please state your name and then ask the question, what school you're from? I'm from Friendship Blow Pierce. I'm in sixth grade. I would just like to ask, if, if you were not selected to be an astronaut, what other career would you have chosen? Okay. Well, that, that's a great question, and that's easy for me to answer because I was an engineer who worked at NASA, and I worked at NASA for nine years as an engineer, and then I worked in mission control. So if I did not become an astronaut, I would still be working for NASA. It's a fantastic place to work. It's got so many interesting jobs, not just astronaut. It has engineering jobs. It has uh, science scientists, jobs for scientists, doctors, researchers, all kinds of folks. It's a great place to work. Great question. Um, my name is Nicholas, uh, and I'm from the Capitol Hill Day School, and I was wondering, what do you research on the space station? Yeah, Nicholas, that's a, uh, that's a great question, and there is a ton of research going on up here. In fact, during our increment, there's going to be over 200 experiments going on. And a lot of those experiments, they range from ones that we don't have a lot of involvement in, such as the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is looking for the origins of the universe. What we do do is help keep the station running, and it utilizes the power and the data and the communication streams to bring that data down to the ground. Then there's uh, experiments where we're more involved, so we're actually executing the experiments uh, in conjunction with the principal investigator down on the ground. So, for example, fluid flow 
uh, type experiments and how they move in different shaped vessels. That's another one that we'll work on. And then there's the experiments where we're very involved in because we're the guinea pigs. And uh, so there's a lot of those where we're trying to figure out what happens to the human body up in microgravity, such as our spines expand. And so we will do things like uh, we'll take ultrasounds of our spines. And again, that'll be working in conjunction with people on the ground that are going to take that data and analyze it. And hopefully that'll help us decide or learn how we can protect astronauts, uh, maybe one of you someday when we do a long duration flight to Mars or beyond. Great question. Next question. Hello, my name is Ajani, and I go to Jefferson Academy in Washington, D.C. And my question is, how different is the transition from being in space to coming back down to Earth on your body? Yeah, that's a good question. When we uh, launch and we arrive here on the space station, our body goes through a lot of changes. And then, of course, when we return back to Earth, our body goes through a lot of changes also. And so it's a, it's a good question. It's a toss-up on which is more difficult or which is harder on the body. I've been through both several times, and I can tell you, when we, when we land, the biggest uh, thing that I notice is I feel very dehydrated. We lose a lot of the fluids up here when we get into space because, our, because of the lack of gravity. A lot of the blood shifts to our head, and our body doesn't need all that fluid, so it, it, we, it really releases all the fluid by urinating more and just ev evaporation and sweating it out. Of course, when we get back to Earth, the gravity is back, so it pulls a lot of the blood back into our legs, and we need that fluid again. So I always feel very dehydrated. And, of course, your vestibular system, you feel dizzy. You feel like you've been kind of on a, a, a carnival ride for a few weeks. So it takes some time before you get your, you know, you're able to walk in a very stable. And, of course, your muscles and your bones have uh, atrophied or gotten weaker over, over a long period of time. But, of course, we exercise a lot to try to minimize that. So your body goes through quite a few changes either when you're on your way up or on your way down. Great question. Uh, hi, my name is Brooke Tewitt, and I, I go to the Bridges Academy, and I wanted to know how many levels of math would I need to take if I wanted to be an astronaut? <laughs> Every level you can find. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you definitely need to study uh, the math, the science, the engineering in school. Uh, most of us have a background uh, in that, uh, though there are, um, there are astronauts that don't have that, uh, that kind of a background. Uh, there's teachers out there. Uh, so a lot of people are, are involved uh, in the astronaut program, and, but math is certainly important, so I highly recommend uh, uh, keep studying it. That's a really good question. I'm, I'm Josie, I'm from Norwood School, and if you had a choice, what area in space would you like to explore? So that is a great question. Where in space would we like to explore? Well, I think the moon is a great place to visit. Uh, it's very close to the Earth. It only takes three days to get there, and so if we want to visit or if there's a problem with the vehicle, we could send help. It's a great place to practice before we move on to more complicated or further places like Mars or, or asteroids and things like that. So I think the moon is a, is a good stepping stone. Great question. Jessica, do you have a question from Mike or Rick? Sure. So... This might apply to everybody. You know, all of us have worked really, really hard our whole lives to get here, and we've, of course, also had a lot of fun doing all the really cool things that we've been fortunate enough to do. But I guess the question is, you know, all this hard work and all this time and waiting, and for us that are going to wait so long, is it worth it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is definitely worth it. It is the most amazing experience that uh, I think you could ever have. Uh, you know, floating is, is truly incredible, and it never gets old. Um, it's something that even as we're working all day long, you, you, just, you just enjoy doing it. And, and it's something that it's uh, unfortunate that we don't get to experience more down on Earth. But it, it is truly incredible. The views of Earth are truly incredible. Uh, it is worth the wait. Fantastic. Okay, next question here from my... My friend right here. 
Come on up. Good morning. My name is Tony. I am a student at Friendship Blow Pierce. I want would like to ask you how did you feel when you were selected to be an astronaut? Good question. Well, that's a great question. When I was first selected as an astronaut, I could not even believe that it happened. I remember getting a phone call and uh, them telling me that I was selected as an astronaut. And I said, oh, great, thank you very much. And the phone call only lasted a few seconds. And then I remember a couple hours later wondering if I really got that phone call or was I dreaming. And I had to call the, uh, I remember I had to call Dwayne Ross, who works in the astronaut selection board. Say, hey, Dwayne, did I really get selected? He said, yes, Rick, you're not dreaming. So it was a very exciting time for me, and, uh, and I'll never forget it. And, and Mike and Rick, Dwayne Ross is actually here with us today. Good question, young man. Okay, so we're going to go to social media now. See okay. what questions are out there. Uh, so we have some great questions coming in, and we have one from Gregorio Pollen, who wants to know what does the space program hope to accomplish this year? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. I think there's going to be a huge uh, or a lot of accomplishments this year. Uh, again, all in those science arenas, I expect to see a, a lot of accomplishments there. You know, sometimes, though, the science, uh, the results from what we're doing up here take take a lot of time because we get we collect a lot of that data we send it down to the ground and and then the scientists they need to have time to look at that data to analyze it and to uh, to come up with some results on that so um, a lot of what we're doing you may not see the results for that until uh, two years from now and so you know there's going to be a lot of big accomplishments uh, just by keeping the uh, the space station running we've got more visiting vehicles that are going to be coming up here we've got uh, we just had orbital come up we're going to have SpaceX coming up soon then another other orbital. We've got Russian progress vehicles coming up, and I'm sure there's going to be some more EVAs that are going to be planned uh, this year as well. So it's uh, it's always busy, and I expect a lot of great things are going to happen this year. Okay. Okay. Hey, I think we have another question from the Ask Ants here. Nick, you've got a question? Yeah. Hey, guys. I, I was wondering if you could... Um, Kind of share with the audience here we talked about working out and trying to prevent bone loss and muscle atrophy could you talk about some of the things that you did in terms of athletics growing up and, and maybe a little bit about what you have to do on station yeah that's a good question nick uh, i always said that uh Flying in space, space shuttle missions that I've done before, and now space station mission, it's a team event. It's a team sport. So I think it's very important growing up to play team sports, uh, football, baseball, basketball, soccer, hockey, all those different sports. I think it's a, it gives you a big advantage to learn to uh, play with your teammates, to work with your teammates, to work together to achieve a common goal because that's what we do up here. It's exactly what we do up here. When you're on a mission, you're working with your crewmates, you're working with the folks on the ground, you're working with the scientists, and it's one big team, one big happy family, and you have to learn to work together. And the only way you're going to move forward and, and accomplish the goals is by working together. So I think it's a directly related, the team sports and the uh, and the, uh, the missions that we do. And growing up, I played, uh, I played a lot of sports. I played football. I played basketball ball and uh, lots of different things mostly in the street with my friends but also some organized sports uh, in the school great now Mike if we were up there together you know the wide receiver defensive back clash would be happening right now you know let's uh, take another question from social media yeah. you're going down <laughs> Okay. <laughs> sure so we have a question for the candidates um, in the tradition of the question asked to the Mercury astronauts, which one of you will be the first in space? <laughs> which one? They're going, they're going as a team together? We're hoping for a big capsule. They can fit eight. OK. Any other social media? Maybe one more question from social media? Sure. Um, what aspect of the training have you enjoyed most? Yeah, for me, that's that's an easy one. Uh, I enjoyed the EVA training. Yeah, for me, that's, that's an easy one. 
Um, I enjoyed spending time um, in the suits, in the water, and it was just absolutely fantastic when you came up here. We, we weren't scheduled to have an EVA. Unfortunately, we had some problems with the station, with the cooling loop, external cooling loop, and so we had to go outside in December and fix it. And, and so getting to take that training, all of that training that, that we spent down on the ground and apply it up here was, was absolutely fantastic. I think Drew, you've got a question? Hey Mike, Rick, uh, Drew down here back on Earth. I had a question, or uh, actually I was going to ask you, rather than to just floating around there s sitting, I was wondering if you could do some acrobatic tricks for us. <laughs> we, we call those stupid astronaut tricks, okay? Yeah, I could get Mike to do some tricks for you. <laughs> Sounds good. Now I got to give him a cookie or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good job. Good job. Okay. Any more social media questions? Sure. Uh, Women in the Air wants to know how has life changed since being selected? Okay. Any for them? That's for us up here or on the ground? I think that's on the ground, on the ground. Guys, but we'll, we'll get another one to you in a sec. <laughs> well, I think it's every aspect of our lives has really changed, and for, for pretty much all of us, it's just a dream come true, and it's still really difficult to believe. You know, every morning we wake up and feel like we have to pinch ourselves to think, could this dream that I had since I was five years old, how could it have actually come true? And all of us had these careers that we absolutely loved. Um, before doing this and so you know it's a little bit sad to leave those careers but of course at any cost of getting our dream our days have changed entirely we all moved together to Houston and and now all became a family together which has been another huge part of it so I think really every aspect of our lives has changed but all in positive wonderful ways great hey Mike and Rick can you tell the, the students here where you're actually floating what is the module that you're currently in and what are the things around you Yeah, right now we're in the U.S. laboratory. Behind us is a uh, node two, and that's where we sleep, and that's where we uh, where we sleep at night. We each have a small crew quarters. Uh, forward of us, or after the space station, is the Russian segment. Here in the U.S. laboratory, there's a lot of different uh, science racks. We have an exercise bike to, to bike to our, our right. On our left, uh, we have a. Uh, it's a glove box, a microgravity science glove box. So there's a science experiment in there right now. We have freezers off over here. Right over the camera, again, you can't see it. We have, a, a so to speak, a galley where we get, uh, we drink, uh, get our drinking water and fill up our uh, food bags and uh, rehydrate our water, I should say. So this is a very busy place. This is kind of the center of the U.S. segment right here, this U.S. laboratory. Fantastic. Well, Mike and Rick, we're really proud of both of you, what you're doing to help advance our civilization through space travel. And you guys look really great. We wish we could be there with you, especially my ASCAN buddies wish they could be there with you. But uh, we look forward to you coming back home. Sometime soon we'll get you a nice greasy cheeseburger for you to eat when you get back home. All right. Thank you so much for this uh, time with the kids and these future explorers, our future astronauts. Give them a big round of applause, guys. And we probably have 30 seconds left for a stupid astronaut trick. <laughs> I'll hold the microphone while he does it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys look great. Thank you so much. He can't be trained. Thanks, guys. Okay, I think uh, they're floating off now. So now we have time to ask our astronaut candidates some questions. So if you come up to the mic, we'll get a chance to ask them what their goals, dreams, and desires are for them to be up in space one day. And All right, uh, my first friend. Um, what does your training include? Oh, oh wait, I'm Ethan. I'm, f I'm from Capital Day School. What does your training include? So, so right now, our, our training includes we have to, one of the toughest things we're doing is learning how to speak Russian uh, because we're going to have to train over in Russia and, and potentially fly up to the station on a Russian spacecraft. 
Uh, but we also are learning how to work together as a crew and flying around in jets, uh, uh, trainer jets. And we're just getting ready to start uh, learning how to spacewalk. So if you've seen the large training pool where they have a, a mock-up or a model of the station, we're going to put on spacesuits and go underwater and practice doing that. Um, that's, that's the bulk of what we're doing right now. And we'll do that for the next uh, probably 18 months. And Nick, could you also tell them your background sure. before you became an astronaut? Sure. So w we all have very different backgrounds. Uh, I'm uh, in the Air Force, and so I was a flight test engineer. Uh, I started out uh, as a, a lieutenant trying to design spacecraft, build spacecraft, and then I got involved with uh, air uh, aircraft as well. Um, and can share everybody else's backgrounds, too. Okay. Okay. We'll go to the next question. Every time you get a question, you'll tell your background. Okay. Thanks. Good question, young man. Future rocket scientist there. Okay. Um, I'm Micah from Jefferson Academy, and I want to know what are the physical and mental requirements to get into the astronaut program? Okay. Who wants to take that one? Christina. Hi, everybody. My name is Christina, and um, formerly to this job, I was an electrical engineer working on NASA's um, space science instruments, designing the gadgets that ride on spacecraft and go study other planets. And then I also worked in Antarctica um, doing remote science in crazy places. So that's a little bit about me. And to get to your question, um, the mental and physical requirements of being an astronaut. Well, you have to mentally be crazy enough to want to do it. That's for sure. Um, they do put us through some psychological tests and some physical fitness tests, but there are no strict absolute requirements. They just want to make sure that we are in shape. So it's important to stay active and exercise a lot and to be someone who is a person who can get along really well in groups and on a team. Um, mentally, you have to be prepared to work well in a team and in a group environment. Great. Thank you. Great question. Okay. I think we have another social media question. Yes, we do. Uh, Oriana Harris wants to know, uh, what educational background do you have? And if it's science, how do you plan to use these skills to your advantage? Okay. Our physicist. <laughs> Was it Ariana? Is that the right name? Oriana. Uh, that's a great question. Um, my background is in physics. I'm a Navy test pilot now, um, or at least I was doing that until a couple months ago. Um, but uh, I did uh, physics in college and, and high energy physics uh, in graduate school. And for me, um, while I probably won't be doing a lot of proton, anti-proton collisions uh, in space, um, the real nice thing about physics, uh, from my perspective, is you, you develop the skills to solve a lot of different problems. Um, and you, you really break it down to the fundamentals and, uh, and, and try not to get too buried in the details initially. And, and you understand it at a, at a higher level. And the simpler the explanation, probably the more correct that explanation is. And that's that what helps me in physics. But I think Jessica's got a different perspective from, uh, from her biology background. Great. Sure, I guess as the, the scientist, I was the friends wanted me to answer this one too. Um, I think, for me, I was a, a comparative physiologist, so what that meant was I was studying the biology of animals that do really cool things, so trying to understand things like how emperor penguins in the Antarctic can dive for so long, and the same thing for seals, or how birds, some species of birds can fly as high as almost the summit of Mount Everest, so I was really interested, since I was a kid, in trying to understand how animals can do these amazing things that, that they do. Um, and that, I think, for me, was always uh, the driving force behind all of that. Whether or not you know, that will relate exactly to what we do, we're going to all be up there doing a multitude of tasks when we're in space. Um, the scientific training, I hope, will help me you know, solve problems and really learn how to think critically for anything that arises. And we'll be involved in a lot of science as well, um, doing experiments, completing exper experiments for other scientists that are lucky enough to have their research flown on the space station or other venues. Great question. All right, come on up. Hello, my name is Aaliyah, and my question is, what college would you recommend me, myself, if I wanted to be an astronaut? Okay. Who wants to take that one? I'll take that one. So really more important than what college that you would go to, the most important thing is that you do go to college and that you stay in school and that you learn and study as much as you can right now. And you might not know exactly what college you want to go to or what you want to study, but you just take as many classes as you can 
and then you keep all those options open. So then you got good grades in elementary school and high school, and then you can choose any college that you'd like to from there. You'll have those good grades to be able to get you into school. So the most important part is to stay in school and keep studying. Exactly. Great. Great answer. Hi, I'm Maddox from Norwood School. Uh, were there any games or activities you did when you were a child that let you know this is what you wanted to do someday? That's a great question. Thank you so much for that. I was, uh, and like many of us, were very involved in our communities, very involved in sports. I was a Cub Scout when I was young, and I have a little boy about your age that's also a Cub Scout. Um, so for uh, all of you, uh, scouting, I highly recommend. Um, all of us were, were athletes, high school and college, and we also um, participated in a lot of community activities. So it's not just doing well in school, but doing well in your community as well. Um, I am, and I was a, a physician in the Army, and um, I also um, went to the U.S. Military Academy, and I was uh, involved in uh, Special Olympics while I was there. So thanks for your question. Great, great question, great answer. We have another question from social media now. Yes, Christopher wants to know if any of you knew how to scuba dive before becoming an astronaut candidate, and if so, what process did you go through to learn that? Okay. That's a good question, Christopher. Yeah. Actually, all of us uh, were scuba divers before we got here, and I think it's just the passion for exploration that drove me to do it, because scuba diving is, to me, is, is I thought it would be kind of like being in space. You get to swim wherever you want. You can go upside down, right side up. You can look at things that human eyes just don't normally look at. So I think it's really cool. And the other side of scuba diving that's really fun is that you're, you have this like really technical piece of equipment feeding you oxygen in an environment that human beings don't live in. So you have to learn to trust that piece of equipment. You have to learn how to take care of it. And you get to see things that are really exciting. So to answer Christopher's question, all of us were scuba divers beforehand. And they have classes. You just look, ask your parents. Uh, they have classes at your local city. You can ask at the YMCA. Um, there's, training classes no matter what, where you live. Great, great answer. And, you know, guys, these guys are really, really smart, but we've all failed at things. So it's not about failing, it's about not giving up. And you had a great answer yesterday when we were at the White House about believing in yourself. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. Thanks for that. The, um, you know, I came from Washington State, and uh, sometimes when you're sitting in your shoes, it's really hard to see your dreams. It's really hard to look at somebody that's an adult that you can't even imagine yourself that age, let alone doing what they're doing. Uh, but the key to achieving whatever you want to achieve, whether it be astronaut or something else, is to go and get your dreams. Your dreams aren't going to come to you. They're not going to be in your comfort zone. And that journey is really scary. Uh, you're going to have to take a class that you don't know if you can pass. You may have to apply to a school that you don't know that you can get into. You may have to move to a city that you've never been to before, and that's really scary. For me, I really remember uh, my plane trip when I was flying from Washington State to New York uh, to go to college. I was really scared. I was sitting there, and I was looking out the window, and I thought, what am I doing? You know, this is really scary. I don't know if I can get through this school. And it would have been really easy at that point for me to tell my parents that I just wanted to stay at home. I wanted to do something else. It would have been easier to give up. But that fear was inside of me, and you have to face that fear. Right. Okay, And every time you face that fear, and you get through it, and you accomplish something, it becomes easier the next time. And if it doesn't become easier, at least it's a familiar feeling that you know that if I feel this, I know that I can accomplish this. Because you know, another time I was sitting on a plane looking out a window, being scared and wondering if I could do this, was earlier this year flying to NASA. I felt like I was 18 years old again going to college. And I was scared. I didn't know if I could get this job. I was coming down to interview to be an astronaut. But I thought to myself, you know what? I've had this feeling before, and it went OK, so I know I can do it this time. But the key is that you can't give up. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what school you go to. You can do it if you keep putting your hand up and keep moving forward. What I always say is don't self-eliminate, OK? You're going to have a 1,000 reasons to not go get your goal, but you're the only one that can stop moving forward. Don't stop moving forward. Don't self-eliminate before you've tried. Exactly. Never give up. All right. Great answer. OK, we have another question here. I'm Sophie from
from Capitol Hill Day School, and what things do you need to know to be an astronaut? Okay, who wants to take that? Vic? What was your name again? Sophie. Sophie. Sophie, that's a great question. What things do you need to know to be an astronaut? I think instead of trying to focus on all the things you need to know, I think you need to have the curiosity to want to know about a little of everything. Someone asked earlier what our day is like, and we do training in foreign languages and in space, er, space systems and um, aerospace flight, uh, and we're going to learn about material science, and we're going to study physical and life sciences, and you just have to be interested. And as long as, just like Ann just said, you're willing to lean in, uh, these are some things that we don't all have a background in, but you have to be willing to, to learn and to be taught. And uh, that's a great question. You just have to be willing to learn about many different things. Great, great answer. Leland, if I could add something to that. Yeah, go ahead, I, Nick. I think it's important to, to acknowledge that we don't know everything. And so every one of us up here has something unique that we bring to the table. And it gets back to what they were saying up on station, that it's a, it's a team. And so you're not always going to have all the answers. And so you've got to rely on the team around you. Definitely, great. Okay, we're going to go here first and then back to social media. Hi, I'm Alex Palameni. Uh, Alex, and I like your shirt too. Very nice thanks. shirt. Yeah. I'm Alex Palameni from Freehold, New Jersey. I was wondering uh, who you thought uh, would win the commercial uh, crew development program, if it was going to be SpaceX, Sierra Nevada Corporation, or Boeing. Great question. My answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I don't think we, we know that answer yet. Okay. We're waiting, we're waiting for that process to, to play out. Good okay. question. Okay, Thanks. back to social media. Okay, we have a question from Irish Space Blog, who wants to know if you're all setting your sights on a flight to the International Space Station. That's a, that's a great question. Um, sometimes, in some dreams that you have, and I think this one especially, you're looking out, and you, you can't even actually define what that dream is. You don't know where you're going to go. And the patches, I, uh, we just designed our class patch, and they, we have a symbol of a star just taking off from the Earth and going somewhere out into space. Because the missions that NASA is looking at are so diverse right now. Some of us are going to end up on the International Space Station. Some of us might go to an asteroid. Some of us might go to Mars. Or maybe we're going to pick you guys. Maybe we're going to pick you to go to Mars. Maybe that's what's in our future. Uh, so we don't know. This class, it's such an exciting time to be at NASA because there's so many different missions that NASA is looking at, and in the next 20 years, uh, we look forward to getting that, answer, qu or that question answered. Fantastic. Does anyone else have questions in the rest of the gallery? We have a mic over here. This is the chance to talk to people that are going to be going to space in the near future. So please, please ask your questions if you have some questions. But we're going to go back to social media real quick. Great. So Alyssa wants to know, for those of you without a science background, what do you think helped you become an astronaut candidate? So I don't have a, a science background. I have a military background. So I'm in the Marine Corps, and I used to fly F-18s, which are, anybody knows the Blue Angels? That's the same type of aircraft, F-18. And so I did have an engineering background. And the Marine Corps helped me out a lot because it taught me a lot about working together as a team. It taught me a lot about leadership and working towards a common goal and a common mission. And so I think that's really helped me so far in our training. And I think it'll help me when I do finally get to go into space um, to work with other people and then to kind of have that discipline to, to stick with what you're doing and make sure that you train properly. Great. Okay. I'm Sarah Kavajay a fourth grader, and my question is, what are the challenges you'll face in space? Great question. The challenges in space. Who wants to take that one? I think that all of us are going to miss our families. We spend almost six months on the space station now, and that's a long time to be away from your family, and we all have families. And so I think that for all of us, that is going to be one of the hardest parts. Thanks for your question. What about radiation? As a, as, a, as a doc, as we go to Mars, what are the types of things we're going to have to mitigate going to Mars? I want to give that to our physicist. <laughs> <laughs> he really did that. That's great. Uh, well, honestly, uh, a lot of us have, have looked at it uh, 
early on in the training here, we get an initial brief on, uh, on radiation risks. Um, and they are, they are non-trivial, but uh, NASA's working really hard uh, to ensure that, uh, that we uh, remain safe throughout our careers. Um, there, there are different times when we have to take uh, special precautions to, to minimize the effects. And, uh, but uh, we're, everyone's watching it very, very closely uh, to ensure that, uh, that, that we're all handled uh, appropriately. Right. And just to let you all know, we have an Orion vehicle going to space in the fall, the fall of this year. And we have a student program called the Exploration Design Challenge, where any of you can sign up to be part of this. Your names can actually go to space on the Orion. And the students that are in high school can actually build a radiation shield that will be down selected. So if yours wins, we will actually fly your radiation shield on Orion, put a radiation sensor behind it, and see how effective it is. So you can be part of helping us get these guys to Mars safely, going through many, many different radiation shields. So go to nasa.gov education, and you can take a look at this program for getting your name in space. Okay. Question. Good morning, ASCANS. Thank you for joining us today in Washington. I'm Gary Lang from Hagerstown, Maryland, and my question is, are you musically in, uh, talented? Are any of you planning to join the Max Q band? <laughs> well, in addition to all the other activities that we had as kids, um, one thing I did was play a lot of instruments. In addition to the sports and everything else, uh, I played the flute and saxophone growing up. Um, in regular band, marching band, wind symphony, and jazz band too. So I really love music, and it's something that I don't do enough now. I really miss it. We've we've had a few conversations about starting a band. I'm not sure if Max Q is actually playing lately. We haven't seen them yet since we've been around, but we might take that bit of advice and try to throw something together. We've got some other musicians in the group, so we'll see what we can do. I Thank think you. the new Ascan band. Yeah. <laughs> I do math a lot better than I sing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Rowan from Capitol Hill Day School, and I was wondering what was the most exciting part of being an astronaut? The most exciting part about being an astronaut, okay. Good morning, thanks for that question. Well, um, so far, I, we've only been in training to be astronauts, so I will answer that question, what's the most exciting thing we've done in training? And for me, by far, it's been flying jets. I have never been a pilot in my life, and three months ago, I went from zero to pilot in two weeks. So <laughs> they stuck me in a cockpit, threw an oxygen mask on me, and told me to start doing aileron rolls and looping the plane upside down. And it was extremely exciting. I've had to work really hard at it, um, but being in the jet is a great feeling, and it's especially a great feeling to know that I can always learn something new, and that even when things are scary when I start, eventually they're going to get easier and easier, and they're going to even be really fun. So thank you. Can you explain what that roll maneuver is? Absolutely. So the aileron roll I learned is when you take the control stick of a performance aircraft, you jam it over to one side, and the plane flips like this. So you're still moving forward, and you just go upside down, and then all the way right side back up again. Um, and the nice part about doing it in a jet is you can just pop an aileron roll in whenever, and the air traffic controllers won't even know, because you stay at the same altitude, and you keep <laughs> going the same direction. <laughs> Great. Hi, okay. my name is Selena. I'm from the Bridges Academy. Um, there was an article this morning about taking Algebra 2 out. How do you feel about that? Taking um, Algebra 2? Out of the curriculum. Okay. Oh, removing it from the curriculum? Yes. Oh. Ooh. I think we all feel pretty strongly about that. Um, <laughs> because without Algebra 2, which uh, if I remember right is right around 8th grade, yeah. generally, yep. now you're going to set yourself up for having problems with geometry and trigonometry, and eventually calculus, which is really the fundamentals of what we do. Uh, you know, whether it's space flight, whether it's physics, any kind of science, the fundamental language of all of these things is mathematics. Just like when we talk, we're talking in English. Well, the language that we speak in, in science is math. Right. And so uh, eliminating algebra, the, one of the most fundamental building blocks of, of a mathematical education, um, is something I would personally uh, hope we wouldn't do. Another quick answer to that. Um, for those jet flights, I actually use algebra every single flight because I have to figure out how much gas I'm going to have left when I get home. I have to figure out the angle to come into a runway at. So you literally use math every time you do something. Um, 
for many technical careers, but especially as an astronaut. Great. Um, my name is Peter, and I'm homeschooled. And I was wondering, how long do you think it'll be before the space station goes to Mars? Well, the space station won't be going to Mars, but one of these guys may. You want to hit that, Nick? Sure. So the so the space station flies in orbit just around the Earth, and so the the launch, the Orion launch that, that Leland was talking about earlier, is one of the first steps that we're taking to building the vehicle that's going to be able to get us to Mars, and so that we're just starting that journey. Okay. But just real quick to add to that, the the space station is is our testing ground. This is where we develop the skills and the technology to be able to eventually go to Mars, and that's why it's so important to that mission. Right. Great. Which planet do you want to go to? <laughs> I want to go to all of them. <laughs> so you hear a lot of doc talk about going to Mars, and that's because that's the planet that uh, NASA's been studying for so long, and we think that that's the most attainable first planet to get to. And when you hear about the moon and asteroids, that's all ways that we're developing technology, not just for the science that we find there and to, to look into history, but to decide what, where can we really go. You know, on Mars, there might be water way down deep inside of Mars, which means if we have water, somebody could live there. So when you're an adult, you could live on Mars if we, if, when we can get there. So that's one of the reasons we really like Mars. But you know what? All those planets, I think we would go to any of them. And I, I have to add to that, Jude, which planet would you want to go to? Because I know you know a lot about space already. What? <laughs> you don't know? Maybe Mars. Maybe you'll come to Mars with us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. Okay, we have another question. Hello, I'm Ari from Norwood School, and I'm wondering if you could go to one place in the universe, where would it be? One place in the universe. No matter where we go in the universe, I think ultimately we are all going to be thankful to come back to Earth because one of the things that we're discovering as we search out all these places that we think might support life, we know that Earth is our home and that we need to protect it. And we really always will look forward to coming back to the good old blue planet. Great answer. Okay, we're going to go back to our Twitterverse and sure. see what else uh, we have. Garrett wants to know more about the aircraft you fly during your training. Great. question. Garrett, was it? Yes. So we fly the T-38N. It is a modified Air Force intermediate training aircraft. It is a twin engine after burning dual uh, tandem cockpit, uh, low swept wing airplane. It's a great airplane for what we do, which is learning to work together in a realistic operational environment, having to make time critical decisions. And it also is a lot of fun because you can do things like what Christina was talking about. I think the most important thing about the aircraft is that it allows us to achieve our space flight readiness training, which is important because we are going to be in situations that are life critical where other crew members are depending on our decision making. And because this aircraft is also the same way, it, it, is, it enforces you to be able to make quick decisions that involve technical answers. And so it's the perfect thing for space flight readiness training. Great. Okay, I think we have a young man right here ready to ask a question. Um, I'm Aviram from um, uh, Mantua Elementary. I'm in fourth grade, and I want to know what um, like things are attached to a spacesuit, and are they comfortable? Good question. Th that's a yeah, great question because we've all just started the process of getting fitted for a spacesuit so we can start training. Um, has anybody been in a full fitting yet? Yeah. So Leland's actually used one, but I can tell you from a glove perspective, uh, <laughs> when I got fit for my gloves, it was, it was uh, one of those moments where I was like, I've been wanting to do this for so long, it doesn't matter how uncomfortable this glove is. <laughs> this is pretty cool. So. Have all of you wanted to be an astronaut from a very early age? Everyone raise your hand if you have. Okay. I was not. <laughs> Just happened later. So we have another question behind you. 
Did technology ever work against you? Ooh, good question. Um, sometimes it does. So you have to be really careful because um, sometimes bad things happen or you know technology fails or the way we thought it was going to be didn't turn out the way that it was. So we have a really big group of really smart engineers and scientists at NASA that work really hard to make sure that we stay safe and that even though we take some pretty big risks sometimes, they take all these measures to try to minimize those risks so that technology doesn't fail us and we don't find ourselves in trouble. Good answer. And you want to you want to utilize the technology, but you want to if it does fail you to still have the ability to use your brain to figure things out yourself. So you want to stay sharp and not just depend on the technology. Good question. For another question. Do you think there is life on other planets? <laughs> I see some heads nodding in the back. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, you know, just speaking about statistics, the probability is that there definitely is some other form of life out there somewhere. It might not be exactly like us. It might be entirely different. So I think it does exist or has existed at some point, but the odds are also that we may not ever find it. We may never see a sign that, we, that it's there, and they may never see a sign that we're there. So I would say if you're talking about, you know, the whole grand scheme of time, it definitely, definitely exists, but we may not ever actually have proof of that, unfortunately. Okay, that was our last question. Let's thank our ASCANs for a wonderful job. And I want to say that we are very proud of you for what you're going to be doing one day with your lives. If you do what our ASCANs told you, believe in yourself, study hard, and you can be anything you put your mind to. So from the National Air and Space Museum, I'd like to thank you. Good job, guys. All right. Guys, take care. And the friends and family will go with our lovely assistant here. If you can see her right here waving. Friends and family, please come on now.